Um, I'd like to back up now to the beginning so we can get the full context of Do you all know that Bruce is the recording engineer for The Doors? Still to this day remasters all the original albums and they're and Be careful what you wish for. And they're magnificent. <laughs> no, the work is absolutely magnificent. Um, you went from doing that to taking a job at CBS, is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. And then that in turn led to meeting Jerry. Yeah. So, I, uh, was always into the newest technology coming down the pipe and thought that digital was an, uh, great. It is, but it isn't. Anyway, um, the head of A&R, Don Ellis, who has passed, he came to me and he said, I'd like you to represent Columbia Records as our producer, as we have financed the entire recording of the score. Star Trek. Star Trek, the motion picture. The motion picture. So that's how I met Jerry, and then that became this, became E.T., became Temple of Doom, became Color Purple, and... In the 25 years of working with Jerry. Yeah. Do you remember the very first meeting with Jerry ever? Oh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. I went to his house, uh, and I had just come back from Hawaii, and I was all in white. I had a very long ponytail, which Jerry... Uh, did not yet. Did not yet. But he moved there. Uh, and uh, I, I think I've been off the plane no more than a day. And I went over and sat with him. And we talked about uh, Star, Star Trek and what I was going to be bringing to it. And I mentioned digital. And he was, he was always a huge fan of anything new. Um, so uh, we had a good relationship from that standpoint. And he was like my brother in some respects. You know, we could yell at one another, and nothing was personal because you know, it was all art. So this would have been 1979. Uh, so, yeah. So digital at that time, you still were not actually looking at when we think of no, we looking didn't. at computer screens with waveforms on it. No. It's just the tape itself was a digital format. Yeah. And there were challenges in actually trying to get everybody's mind wrapped around that. Mm -hmm. Were there? Um, in recording that well, there, were, there, were, there was a little bit of a problem that happened in the middle of recording Star Trek, let's say middle, about two-thirds of the way through, where the first chair of the French horns section decided that because we were recording dis digitally, we were going to put the musicians out of work. That it was an instrument. It wasn't an instrument. It was a recorder. Uh, so. He got the Musicians Union to come down. I met with the head of the music department at 20th Century Fox, uh, Lionel Newman, who was actually conducted most of Star Trek, motion picture. Um, and uh, the union said, uh, we're going to shut the picture down unless you take this equipment out of here, which was completely crazy. And I mean, I had the power because I had the purse strings. Uh, to do it, but I just acquiesced. I you know, called New York and said, "We got a, we got a problem, and the only solution is to just continue recording in analog, and I'll get it on a digital, and we'll finish it," which is what happened. But uh, there was a, I've told this story in print a few times, but basically, the record company wanted to do a big deal about the fact that it was Star Trek, and we were recording digitally, and I at the Audio Engineering Society Convention in uh, January of 2000, no, 1980. I went there and they had, no, it wasn't, it was, uh, excuse me, it was October of 79. I, they had a digital editor that they had built. It was the first one in the world, it was hand built. And somehow or another I convinced them to let me have it so we could edit Star Trek. And it worked great. Jerry and I, at my office at Columbia Records, put the album together, and we were having a great time. And then he decided he wanted to change the sequence of what cue was where, and wanted to take out a little repetition, because Jerry didn't feel that on the record there should be more <coughs> than needed to be. Because a lot of times there were repeats built in to cover a sequence, you know, to stretch it. So we set about doing it, and the damn editor stopped working. 
and the next morning I had to cut lacquer matches before CD. Uh, and we had to have a half a million pressings uh, eight days later. In the stores? Yeah, huh? In the stores, eight days later? Or mm -hmm. shipping? Getting ready to go, and as um, party favors at the premier at the uh, Space and Science Museum in Washington, in, right? in Washington, D.C. And they were kind of counting on it, uh, being mastered off of digital and all that. Well, my life was truly over because I could, you know, I saw myself getting fired and everything. So I had taken the, all the equipment down to Capitol Records. And my master engineer, his name is uh, Wally Traugott, which is German Traugott for trust in God. <laughs> and um, I got it in there and I was preparing to transfer it all to analog, do the edits, and then master off that. Because I had no choice. I go to dinner with my wife and I'm trying to eat. I could, it's like the scene from Young Frankenstein, you haven't touched your food, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so I, had, I, I hadn't touched my food. I couldn't eat. It was like, you know, hanging at a you know, by a thread and somebody's going to cut it and you're going to die. So I come back in the Capitol, I'm walking down the hallway, and this very large gentleman, not much different from Dave, and he comes up to me and he says, Hi, I'm John. And he says, You don't know me, but my wife is a psychic. And she says, You're working with some new equipment that's doing something strange, and I think I can help you. And I looked at him, I said, you're kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, no. So I said, OK. So I put all the gear back in the car, went over to Columbia Records in Century City, set it all up. He got his wife on the phone, we had her in the speakerphone, and he proceeds touching all the equipment. <laughs> and he says, no, everything's good, everything's good. And she's over the phone saying, yeah, this is okay, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing. She says, make an edit. So I put the tapes back in, recall the edit, aborts. And she said, what are you recording on? I said, well, it's on tape. She said, so I eject it, because these are on video cassettes, three quarter inch pneumatics. And uh, eject them, she, he held the source tape, which is the one that Jerry and I had done the night before. Nothing wrong with that one. Took the one that, in the recorder. She said, it's got a defect. And I went and looked at it, and sure enough, there was a time code interruption on the track. And, the, and right where I was doing the edit is exactly where the interruption was. So, mm -hmm. we so I, you know, put a new roll in, quickly re-edited it, and about two hours later, because everything in those days was linear. It's not like how we work today in hard drives, uh, hard disk uh, editing systems. Yeah, after real time. Real time, everything is in real time. So if it took an hour program, it could take you a couple of hours to do it. And then you had to QC it to make sure there were no dropouts before it went. Anyway, we got over to Capitol, got it done, and I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> now in those days, so this was, your digital was all direct, just two channel stereo, Two right? channels. There was no multi-channel nope. yet. So that, this would be a live mix? These were live mixes. Yet, you also did, there's also multi-track as you and I a few years ago where I, so the movie would be mixed analog. Yeah. This was a digital live two-track stereo mix. Right. And when we went and remixed Star Trek The Motion Mission, we transferred everything off the original 16 tracks, uh, a, a two-inch tape, and discovered that it was running at 30 IPS, which was incredible, and the, the tapes were in incredibly good condition. But when I when we got into it, I was really surprised because all I had ever heard up to, when did we do this, four years ago? 2011 and 12, right? Okay. Um, I had only been listening to the stereo all these years. I never had my hands on the multi-tracks since then. And it was amazing because of Jerry's insistence, and he even did it with all the movies that I did, wanted to get live mixes. I mean, a lot of the films we did, like Gremlins and three other things, everything was live to four or six track magnetic film for the film. Poltergeist was this way, E.T. I mean, it was a majority of the film. Didn't go had. back and remix later. We didn't go back and remix, you got it live. And uh, 
when we got into it, I was really surprised because the tracks were actually kind of minimal. We didn't have as much control as we thought we did. It was basically the three track mix and some sweeteners right, and right. things like that here and there. Uh, so, uh, and that would have been basically because it was all John Neal's call about how many mics and how to place them. Well, yeah, but Jerry made him, made him shut stuff down. Ah, okay. See, Jerry decided he wanted to. <laughs> it's one of the last films that that Lionel Newman conducted for Jerry. I mean, there was a history because Jerry was Lionel's uh, fair-haired boy. He loved him, Jerry. <laughs> And uh, back to the 60s, he was conducting. Oh, yeah, stores. and he used to conduct, uh, and that was one of the things. I mean, politically, it was convenient, and Jerry also was not a good conductor then. He used to go, when I first started working with him, I remember on uh, Gremlins. I mean, we had a stack of towels because he perspired so much. I mean, because he was like this. You know, you think he was going to take off and fly. But, <laughs> but, but at the, at later on, and I'm trying to think what movie it was, at Paramount that we were doing, he decided to become a real conductor. And um, he started taking lessons from a, a gentleman named Sam Crack Mullins, who was the main conductor of the the opera in Rome, I'm trying to think which one. La Scala. I think it was the La Scala. Anyway, so, and this man was, was beautiful. He always dressed in a brown suit, and he was very robust, and very bushy red hair, <laughs> and he had a smile. He looked like a Cheshire cat. I mean, he was, but good teeth instead of <laughs> And, and uh, uh, he would sit there during the sessions uh, in the middle of the orchestra with a score and make notes and watching Jerry and then correct Jerry as well. And then Jerry, but Jerry realized that he, in order to get more out of his scores, he needed to conduct. And even John Williams like that. But John always conducted his own music, whether he, you know, whether he was a good conductor until he became a good conductor. You know, you have to go to school and learn this stuff from somebody. Even David Newman was taking conducting lessons when I was working with him. Wow. Yeah. I want to see Explorers. Huh? Would that be Explorers or Paramount? The the explorers, explorers or Paramount? Oh, it could have yeah. been. I thought maybe it was maybe. it was maybe. Maybe. Darkness. No. But they weren't there about that. I want to go back to just button up that story about the psychic because you missed oh. one point about it. Is that you actually never found out who that was? Yeah, I could never with. again find him. <laughs> and his wife. Wow. Uh, and it's one of those things that happens in life that, that are kind of cool. And you, yeah. you know, I mean, I've tried for uh, since 1979 to find him. Like, wow. No one knows <laughs> of him funny. at Capitol. I mean, going way back. So working on as many soundtrack projects that I do, and getting no, no other engineers. There's this. P unique relationship between a composer and engineer, and sometimes a composer tends to stick with somebody. You know, you got John now for many, many years with Sean Murphy, Alan Silvestri with Dennis Sands, you know, uh, James Horner liked uh, Simon Rhodes. Um, before that, John before Sean, Sean. Sean, yeah. So, um, you know, the Danny Wong was always with Lalo. So, what is it about that relationship? Is it just a matter of trust, or is it just a matter of this a shorthand, or, you know, um, yeah, what is it about? Uh, I can only tell you from my standpoint, I, and I probably if Dennis was here or Sean here, they'd probably answer the same way, is that there's a communication between the composer and, and the mixer, uh, unsaid, where I know that Jerry would, would write a score, he'd walk in, and somehow or another, I knew what the, it was to sound like, and I hadn't heard one note of music. It was just one of those things. And then as it developed, you know, then I would, it would start to come clearer in my head as to what my body as to what it was supposed to be like. But, you know, there was a common thing that, that Jerry and I heard a lot the same. And uh, I, there, there was one time I said to him, foolishly, I said, ah, so you getting to hear this as you imagined it. And he said, I already heard it in my head. He said, you know, he says, you're just, you know, taking it to another level. What, um, going from the doors and working in the pop music, what was it about 
what drew you to actually go into film score and being around an orchestra? Oh, well, my, my parents were both musicians. My mother was a music copyist for Frank Sinatra and Mackie Cole and a lot of stuff on Capitol Records. Uh, and my father was uh, played viola. And he started out as a violinist and he was a, a, a rock star in the uh, 20s and the 30s. There was a band called uh, George Olson and Ted Fiorito Orchestra, and he used to play all the solos. So, uh, and even then he told me that the guys were always stoned out of their minds, so smoking <laughs> a lot of pot. He didn't do it, but they did. Were you particularly looking for an opportunity, or did no, it just happen? No, I just used to go to I used to go to sessions with my dad or my mom, and I was very intrigued by what happened. I even tried playing an instrument. I mean, I played it reasonably well, clarinet and saxophone, but I knew that wasn't my calling. My calling, uh, when I was a little kid, I remember my dad took me to a session, um, and I wound up in the control room. And they let me push the button and say, take one. <laughs> and the power of pushing the button. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, it was something there. It's, it's, uh, it's like being a photographer, uh, a, a cinematographer in some respects, where I visualize in my head, my what I hear in my my head, my body, is what comes out, and uh, I think that's that's one of the things. I mean, I was able to understand what Jerry was trying to say, even with John, you know, and other composers that I've worked with. It's just being able to relate, to know where they're going, and you don't have to ask, say, did you want this, do you want that? You know, because they hire you for what it is that you bring to it. It's in anything that we do. Even if you're washing a car for a living, if you do it a certain way that is better than, or different than, than other people do, you know, people come to you for that. So it's, it's my visualization, it's how I visualize music. So now you actually were not the scoring engineer of credit on either Poltergeist and E.T., but you were with Jerry from Star Trek and then mm -hmm. interim scores like The Final Conflict, The Secret right. of Nim, Night Crossing, Under Fire. And then, uh, but you were basically always I'm basically with him, producing, producing the digital yeah. recordings and... The yeah, there were a lot of, in the early days, like in the case of Poltergeist and E.T., um, I think yeah. after that, this Twilight Zone movie, you actually became the yeah, engineer. Yeah, right. But at that time, the, uh, the unions were very, very strong, and especially at the studios, and guest mixers were not allowed, even though I was a member of the union. You know, the I am, and still am. Um, so uh, in the case of Poltergeist and E.T., uh, Lyle Burbridge, lovely guy, uh, who was the head of the sound department then. And you got to understand this was still MGM. So it was, it was real. I brought some photos, but I think that you got them, you want to show Yeah, we also have some. Uh, that, uh, Do you want to look at them? Yeah, no, why not? Okay. talk about them. Um, it, how E.T. came about, I imagine you're going to ask well, yeah, we'll get this, this because <laughs> I was doing, pol the second film I did with Jerry was Poltergeist, and I couldn't work the console, but I could bring microphones in and set it up and stand behind Lyle and say, start with this, add a little EQ, a little reverse, bring this up, okay, you know, it's basically great. There's Lyle, and there's Frank Marshall. And this is the MGM and this stage, is now the Sony stage. And now you can see, but this console, is right up against the glass. And the loudspeakers were behind you, and it was set up six track because that's what they used to do. You know, movies like Exodus and Spartacus and you know, anything like that. How, do you have any other photos or just Oh like yeah, that? I can let it go to the it, it'll go to the next one in a second. Oh you will? I've just been pausing between them. Oh okay. Um, these are ones that I took. This is the machine room. We were even though this is a six track, we were recording on four track. And what you see here are dubbing our, our uh, reels of dialogue and a click track. 
the Ken Hall, I don't know if you guys know who Ken Hall is, but mm -hmm. Ken Hall is, in my estimation, uh, Great music the best editor. music editor for film ever. And he was with Jerry and John at Fox in the 60s, yeah. and basically part of this group of people. Right. So, In fact, let me just interject, that, you know, I've always imagined that it's like you and Kenny Hall and Arthur Morton, the orchestrator, were kind of like three points of a triangle holding up Jerry. Yeah, I think that's and Joe Sandy took over. Joe Sandy took over, yeah. Alexander, Alexander Carrage. Carrage, yeah. Oh, yeah. Carrage, yes. yeah. Uh, There's the stage. It, you know, really hasn't changed much. The only thing that I've noticed, and I'm, I'm going to try and push if somebody, it depends on how much, many scores I get to do there. If you can see these boxes there all around, those were in the room. And the room, to me, sounded better then. I mean, they're even up high. It had more reverberation for some reason. When, I, when you walked in the room, you almost thought you were in a, in a concert hall that had a short reverb time. And this is, of course, very time. hallowed halls where all those great MGM musicals were. Now, all of them were down. Where yeah. Alexander Garage wrote most of the, the uh, arrangements for all the songs. Um, can you make that move faster? You can see my M50 microphones up above there on top. These are, are microphones that were devised by the Germans for German radio broadcast. And uh, they're just superb. No, ah, the digital recording. This is the four track digital recording we were doing for ET and, a, and, a, and, Poltergeist, and yeah. Poltergeist. They would lock them up. So that you could get three channels. So I could get three channels. Sure. And here are the loudspeakers. And if you, there's a there's a Elvis Presley film that I actually dubbed, and th they rehearsed in this room. This is part of the control. This is a, still exists. It's a gigantic space, and these were the same loudspeakers that they have in the dubbing theater theaters. So it was really cool. You recorded through these things, and when you went on the dubbing stage, you didn't have any surprises. Right. It was the same. Was the same. And it was really cool. I think that's all. If you have questions as we're wrapping, go ahead. That's all I was doing. That are the only photos you've got. Is there more? No, I think there are a couple more. Or is that a... He doesn't have them digitally. Do you want to see? Well, um, I mean, I got them. But the um, thing about Poltergeist is that the, there was an interesting thing that happened with regard to actually booking the orchestra. Yeah. Because of the, the, every... Oh. The session musicians were booked. So what happened with that? Well, there were... The... Um, there were too many sessions going in town. Those days, the orchestras worked a lot. I mean, if it was, they were busy at, at uh, Fox, they were busy at Paramount, they were busy at Warner's, you know, and there were a few small independent places. Um, and we could get into to MGM, and we didn't have an orchestra. So Jerry said, well, let's hire the Los Angeles Philharmonic. <laughs> which we did, and uh, that was spectacular uh, because that was a unit that played with one another daily. They paid attention to dynamics that were written on the page. It was, I mean, Jerry, I remember he came in after the first cue, and he says, this is phenomenal. It's like being in London, because that's the way they're in London. In London, they have six full-time practicing symphony orchestras and you can hire an entire orchestra. So when you saw these, the Los Angeles Philharmonic trucks and all Yeah, they came in and they loaded it up, they set it up, you know, you didn't touch anything. This is, you know, we set up our cables afterwards, yes. How much time would be spent on a particular score, whether it be a particular cue or the whole score, how much time? Normally it was three and a half days. It's not a lot, but two yeah. sessions a day sometimes. The third day usually was one session. Uh, Star Trek The Motion Picture, on the other hand, was 22 right. sessions. <laughs> <laughs> That's because they, we had lots of time on that film. Well, plus the 20 minutes of, Q, of scores, first bunch of they got thrown out. out. Yeah. Right. Uh, Robert Weiss and Jerry were very close. Yes. I remember in, you guys said that was this Christmas that you had. Uh, also, the black hole from Disney. Do you know if that was recorded here with the musicians? Because that was also a digital. They, I think it was a different process. No, they did that. It, they did that on on uh, uh, 3M32 tracks, and they did that at uh, Disney, which is the scoring stage is now a uh, 
um, W theater. Hmm. It's the only well, one they've got left. How was that not a threat to the union, whereas what you were doing was a threat? Well, Sean Murphy was the mixer on staff at Disney, so that was no threat. Okay, um, okay, I got it. We've got to understand that movie studios generally insisted that the scores had to be recorded there right. and posted there. And later, I mean, Stephen had enough cred that he could go elsewhere. When we did Poltergeist in ET, his offices were on the lot at MGM. That's where the first Amblin office was. That's where Irvin well, Calder's office. Was. Yeah, mm -hmm. and yes. You, when you mentioned this before, the thing that always really surprised me is what was the threat that they were, what were they afraid of? Well, you don't want to usurp somebody else's jobs. Was, but I remember you also saying that for digital recording, I think they were interpreting um, digitally recording as somehow replacing the Yeah, they thought it was an instrument yeah. right. that they, they, they could suck it in yeah. and we could take the individual notes out of there and make an orchestra. But then it was impossible. Well, truly yeah. impossible. And so that's why only part we done digitally at that point. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yes. Uh, did you guys continue to hire the L.A. Phil? No, and that, that was the one and only time. <laughs> but, but Jerry and I talked about it a lot. But he, you know, through uh, um, working with, with the contractor, uh, he was able to actually put together an orchestra that he really thought was going to be great. And it was. I mean, they really got, and he was, he was on it. And the, and the better he got as a conductor, the more he started saying, you know, well, I put those dynamics there for a reason. And John, I've seen John do that too. He just said, hey, play it. What do you see at bar 32? Do you see a diminuendo? Play it. <laughs> you know, I mean, nicely, but basically. I mean, we, we got down to uh, even doing it with the orchestras in London. Of We'd have 32 violins. And Orchestras sometimes can get lazy if they don't like you. Mm. But they orchestra love Jerry and John. Um, and we'd always say, uh, I say, Jerry, let me hear the violins. Let's hear the back section. And so they had to play. <laughs> and to let them know that we're listening. You know, things like that. Any time that uh, Poltergeist is discussed in any way, the one subject that has never gone away for 35 years is the subject of the director. And, um, no, by the way, the blood is from Mike. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, so, if so, anybody. Yeah, sorry about that. So, it's an effort. But uh, God rest the soul of Toby Hooper, very, very talented man who we just lost this year. But was he around at the sessions? No, all? Toby Hooper was not there. It was totally Stephen. And I, and I mean, you know the scene where the father looks in the mirror and starts pulling his. Oh, the assistant. The the assistant yeah. yeah. And that's Stephen's hands. Hands. Yeah. Yeah. Doing that. Um, so where do you come down on that whole issue, or do you have a... What do you mean? About the... the uh, I, 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 it, if you go back in the history of Hollywood, not sexually, <laughs> 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 um, but uh, historically, uh, uh, directors used to make six features a year directed, and they didn't post them. They went and shot them, the producer took and edited them, took them into the dummy station. Finished. That was the role the of the director. The way on to And then he went on to the next film, or she did. So, you know, in this case, I didn't think anything strange about it. Right. You know, either Toby went on to another movie, or there were disagreements about style, stylistically, or how the film was to come out. But also, Steven was, was, was kind of launching his production company with this right. thing as a model for what Amblin was going to do. Right. So, right. Uh, he had a lot riding on it. Yeah. So, Stephen took it over. Are you all up for a, a, a kind of a longish clip from Polar Guys with no music? Mm -hmm. yeah, Follow up with it, and we maybe we'll go step in the back. So I, again, this is um, a cue called "Let's Get Her," mm -hmm. and the interesting thing about it is that it's basically a speech followed by a three-minute unbroken tape in the upstairs hallway with pe people just standing talking. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's a seven and a half minute clip we're going to show. Um, the amazing thing is, is that that's all there is. It's just a speech and an unbroken take um, of people talking. 
And um, so you've never seen this before, and it's an opportunity to really see, it's like um, what, what you've really got before the composer comes in. So let's take the lights. Pretty amazing. But the thing is that the filmmaking is so strong, the acting is so strong, the, all the components are so strong in it. Mm -hmm. So as, what's your, what's your, how do you feel like when you see this without music? Well, I think it's real powerful. I, I more than once have seen films with Jerry or alone before we went in to record them, before Jerry had written the music. Um, and, and if you can watch a film without the music, it takes on a whole different thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember one uh, Rambo, uh, El Rambo Dos. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, I went into Andy Vanya, who was the producer for, and the owner of Caracol Pictures, asked me to come by and see it before we scored it. Went to London to do it. And I sat through the film. You know, it, it's a fair amount of comic book in the film, but it was at a time uh, coming out of the wars and whatnot that it really rang true without the music. And I, I, came, I came out with a screening and he said, so what did you think? I said, I got angry. And he said, good. And then, you know, Jerry fed on that. Not what I said, but that was his reaction as well. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's really interesting for a composer, especially Jerry never liked to, to see a film that was tempt. Or did he? Did any he, he did with yours? Yeah, that's... Oh, he did trust me, I like it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Bono's the story about uh, Joe Dante uh, sticking Bernard Herman into everything. Right? Well, he and do that, yes. <laughs> and it's he, like, oh, Christ, he, Joe Dante. And then, uh, what, was the, what was the uh, uh, the Italian composer that we did in... Uh, in, um, in the Burbs? In the Burbs. Marconi. Marconi. Marconi, yeah. Marconi, yeah. Marconi, there's a sequence in there that Joe oh. just wanted Marconi. <laughs> so bad. So we're going to look at this again um, with just Jerry. <laughs> no, no doubt on the sound effects now, but you have a choice. We can either do it with subtitles to help or just clean since you just heard it. Anybody feel like they need, need for subtitles? I think so. No, no subtitles? Yeah. Okay. I think subtitles. I would think. Who, who wants subtitles? I do. You want subtitles? Well, yeah, well, I mean, I was, without it, I was having trouble figuring it out. <laughs> All right. I mean, but this is this is this a stem that was a dub stem? It's actually I had three track effects and mono dialogue. Okay, so it was mixed. Yeah. Okay. So, but I mean, it's all mostly nothing going on there. Yeah, I mean, they're all so whispering, so. so it's real hard. Right, right, right. So, should we do it with subtitles? Yeah. Okay. So, same scene then with subtitles. Okay. This is it's, and you'll hear the voice of Kenny Hall calling to sleep. Yep. And uh, some. Uh, that was Kenny always did the slates for all of our takes. And so, and some I stage, didn't have to some, push the button. Anymore. And some stage chit chat. Yeah. And I believe this was grabbed in one take. This performance. Uh, just so you uh, know, there's one insert. There's Jerry, one insert. Jerry. Ten times out of ten, if he had a long piece, he would rehearse the orchestra, maybe for three hours. Go to lunch, come back, do a take. Nail it. And nail it. And then may, there might be a pickup for a couple of bars where somebody did a flub and they'd get it. And, just and he did it. not like to do what John did, which is six measures of this take, four measures of that take, then back to this take. Well, Jerry was mostly a master take and a few little things. On, e, on E.T. and uh, Temple of Doom, John did complete takes. And yeah. did inserts. That, no, later on. Later on, he's into that now. Yeah, uh, I don't know. If, is that what he's doing? Yeah, now? it's a mm -hmm. lot of intercutting, lots of. That. Yeah, we never. We used to get complete takes, and the reason for that was Jerry liked the performance. Right. Not so manufactured, but just well, kind of it natural. Isn't, per perfect isn't necessarily the best. Right. Mistakes okay. are good, right, Marshall? Okay, let's hear great, the great Jerry Goldsmith. Boy, do I miss Jerry when we look at a scene like that and hear that kind of music. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that continued, that collaboration continued till we lost him in 2004. Mm. Right? How many scores? Maybe 50? More? I don't no, know. no, I did over 100. Oh, right. Oh, scores. But, you know, some of them I didn't record, some of them I just mixed. Some of the, you know, it depended on whether the company could afford to fly me over or whether there was, like in the case of English films, where they had uh, something called the Edie Plan, 
if it was financed partially by the British government, you work with British If you people. spent so much money over there, yeah. right. So um, you mentioned electronics, and of course, the, it's interesting that this score has no electronics. Right. The sequel has a lot of them. A lot of it. So there was a, in the, the early 80s, there was this transition well, when I first, where Jerry became more enamored of them. Well, he, yeah, he, he loved electronics. I mean, he started on Logan's Run with uh, an ARP 2500. And we utilized that on Star Trek The Motion Picture along with the beam. And those were, that was the beginning of real electronics for him. Right. Uh, but even like the very next year when you get to Psycho 2 and Twilight Zone, suddenly there's electronics. Yes. Where on this well, one he decided but, none. But uh, on Twilight Zone, did we do Twilight Zone first and then grew up Gremlins? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, at that time, see today, you can program electronics to what the composer can do it in his writing, and it'll play. It'll kick kick off the the synthesizers and play everything. You know, so they doesn't need musicians anymore. For that goes back to uh, what the musician taking was frightened of. Um, but he was. On Twilight Zone, we had four keyboardists, one of them was James Newton Howard, <laughs> who I brought into that circle. Uh, and they played synthesizers, parts that Jerry had written, he had found the sounds that he wanted, played them through guitar amps, you know, Fender amplifiers on the stage, and they had volume pedals. So they had to play and do their dynamics according to the score. So Jerry was conducting in the room, full orchestra and electronics in the room. So it was so not uh, right into a board, but actually record we recorded acoustic. Well, both ways. Both I, did, ways. I did both. You know, I would what he would do out into the room. I would then enhance it with the direct signals off the synthesizers just to get a little presence so that I could treat it and add more reverb or whatever, you know, depending on what the, what the, the cue demanded. But that was the first time for him to really go for it. And it was really cool. Which one was that, sorry? Uh, Twilight Zone, the motion picture. Um, you should listen to it. The, the, one, the cool thing about it is that electronics, for the most part, when you have them running with an orchestra, they're really two-dimensional. They're just there. They're either loud or soft. Whereas with an orchestra, you've got depth. I've got from here to the back row. So there's a lot of depth in imagery where you can literally walk around in the orchestra. So by having the electronics play live in the room, they could be balanced with the orchestra and we had more three-dimensionality. Um, we did it. Same thing on Gremlins. And then he went off to England to do Supergirl. Oh. And tried it there, and I wasn't part of that. Um, with um, Eric Tomlinson. Eric Tomlinson, mm -hmm. who did the Star Wars trilogy. Star Wars, Raiders, he, yeah. he did Jerry's only score, the one in the Academy Award. The Omen. Yeah. The Omen. Brilliant mixer. Uh, but somehow or another, when they hooked it up, something went wrong. And uh, they were playing, and the uh, two of the loudspeakers in the studio that were doing it at Abbey Road, instead of having lots of different amps and you know, guys playing it, they had a guy there mixing on a board in the room. Jerry go, more S, you know, S one, you know, G, you know, whatever. And uh, the loudspeakers caught on fire. <laughs> <laughs> he was producing some wave in there that was just perfect to, to generate electricity. <laughs> and, and, it, and that was the end of that. Wow. <laughs> and then did you go, you ended up? No, I wound up going to England. We re-recorded the score. And uh, Eric was there, but he was basically hmm. side. I had to do like I did with uh, Lyle just Burbridge. Stand there and do stand there and with this face. Tell him what to do. Wow. The fire is <laughs> no, there we just took the electronics no, I, I, and, uh, and, and then I wound up mixing it all. So Poltergeist being an MGM film yeah. for the Nascent Amblin Productions located at MGM, mm -hmm. 
um, with a score done at MGM made sense. Now, John Williams had done, he had his period with John Neal on the Star Wars albums and then the recording of. Um, well, he did Jaws. No, no, he didn't. He did the album of he Jaws. Did, yeah, he did so, Jaws. Uh, but 1941, for example, was, was John at Fox. At, uh, no, at Warner's. It was it Warner's? 41? Yeah. It was a, oh, the trailer was at Fox and the score was at oh, Warner's. Okay. Well, I went to so, a score a at Fox. The trailer score, yeah. For the trailer score. Right. So I got chased up. <laughs> but then, but, but John was doing it in his London period of the original Star Wars trilogy and Raiders. Mm -hmm. um, then came back for his next picture with Stephen was going to be E.T. Right. So, but Poltergeist played a direct role in how that was yeah. going to be handled, correct? Yeah. Uh, he came Stephen to told him. Well, he was. I guess Stephen had felt that he had gotten everything out of Fox that he wanted to get out of it, and he was. He wanted to go to a fresh place that where there was no history, you know, negative or whatever. And he was really enjoying Poltergeist at MGM with, with what we were doing with the group. And he uh, said, John, I really would like to do it here at MGM. My offices are here, it just makes sense. So John came down and he and Jerry, they're within two days of one another, Birthwise, I believe <coughs> their birthdays. The, the, the dates, yeah. Yeah, and um, they were very close. They used to play four-hand piano together on New Year's Eve, and you know all that kind of stuff. They had the same, I think, composition teacher. Yeah, yeah, everybody, you know, and they were competitors, but they were good friends, you know, like tennis players. You know. So uh, one day John showed up, and I had never met John. You know, I knew him in his jazz days when he was Johnny Wood. Uh, knew of him. And all the stuff they did for Capitol Records. Um, and he showed up and he sat there and he listened and he watched and then he huddled with Stephen. And the next thing I knew, I got a call. You want to do this movie and John's going to do it. Didn't tell me what it was. I found out when I got there and got a badge. <laughs> <laughs> and even then didn't even know what the film was about. Wow. Steam was super secretive, as he is, generally. Yeah, to this day. On, on films. Uh, on this one, I, I guess that he did uh, the first reading with the, with the cast. They couldn't take scripts out. Right. They had to be right then. And they walked out there where they couldn't talk about it. <clears throat> you know, nothing. And it, and it held true even to going to MGM to record this thing. And I was told it was very secret. He had guards. No guests no, coming no on. No guests, nobody, no nothing. The only guest that showed up was George Lucas. Mm -hmm. Wow. So Hulker guys started recording in January, mm -hmm. and then um, we're now into March for E.T. E.T., yeah. So, um, but this, now you have regular sessions. Got the regular studio regular, 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 right. So apart from the L.A. film, basically everything was the same, yeah. including Kenny Hall. Yeah. How did that come about? That was movies? curious. Even I though think, he did Heartbeats the year before with John. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Kenny, Lom uh, Kenny uh, Lomberg? Lom Lomberg, who was the, the, he and Ken Hall were the, the editors of Fox, music editors. They were really a team. And Kenny Womberg had done all, had been John's editor. Well, he was also a composer. And he was doing a movie. He had written a score. So he could not do E.T. So Jer I guess Jerry and Kenny, and then right. Kenny Womberg talked to, to uh, John and you know, said, you know, you should work with Ken Hall. Right. Well, I mean, he had done his last film, as I said, Heart yeah, the year but before, even so, so he you knew know, them. John, you know, John, they were all part of that Fox group with Lionel put together in the They're all very loyal to Lionel. Yeah, including Arthur Morton was there. Mm -hmm. Herbie Spencer, who was John's right. orchestrator. What do you remember about him? I was heard Morton was mm, Not too much, except on E.T. Mm -hmm. That was the only time that I, why, why, no, wait a minute. No, I worked with him on uh, Temple of Doom, yeah. too. Mm -hmm. yeah. So... Okay, so it's so in March of 82 come the E.T. scoring mm -hmm. sessions, highly secretive. Highly secretive. And uh, is this your first look at the picture at all? Absolutely. I mean, he didn't even want to do playbacks against picture. 
he didn't want the orchestra turning around and looking at the screen. Oh my God. Wow. Wow. Well, we, 35 years ago. Unlike, unlike the Star Trek The Motion Picture, where most of the time it said, scene missing. <laughs> 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 the orchestra would turn around and go, that again? <laughs> you know. Well, uh, we just got past Halloween, so why don't we run the Halloween sequence from E.T. with no music. Oh, goodness. And, uh, and see what that looks like, just laying bare before John Williams comes in. Yeah, so just uh, this year is when we did, yeah. we pulled back, the, we had an uncut set of the mag, right, 35 million mag with the live four track mixers, right? Uh, so we used to record double machine, and surprisingly enough, the B-reels were never cut. Mm -hmm. Then when we went to Universal together, and they brought them out, and I looked in the, I nearly passed out, I couldn't believe it. We had all the sheets and everything yep. was there, and except for one room. Right. Which we had to get off the fourth time after. Right, because there was um, some issues with, um, I guess, last minute changes to the picture and the creation of the album. Yeah. And some things maybe got moved around. And this is the thing that happens when we go back so many years later, even with something as high profile as mm -hmm. that, sometimes things don't stay together. Um, in the case of the album for this, you were the you co producer. <coughs> Mm -hmm. Right, and it was interesting because on something say like Jaws, that album was completely re-recorded. Yeah. Raiders used the actual film mixes for the album. The ET was kind of half and half. Half and half. And how did that come about? Well, and, um, both both John and Jerry. In those days, it was it was easier to do because we had record sales, uh, physical media. Um, they would schedule either one or possibly a double session and uh, go in and, and they would rewrite, rearrange some of the cues that they felt was better as a listening piece than to have extended areas and doing a lot of editing. So in this case, we went in and recorded one evening a few cues for the album. It was two evenings. Two evenings, or two evenings. Um, I don't remember exactly. Right, and we could not find those. And we couldn't the, find the masters. Right. Mm -hmm. But do you, do you recall that it might have really been done just digitally? Uh, no, no. Uh, we, I think it might have been done just digitally. The there was no reason to put it Here's the film. interesting thing. This is Except my, the one mean? thing. What? The, Go the, ahead, you bring it up. <laughs> that we did from this session that wound up in another room. Oh, oh, oh no, that's right. Oh, yeah, there were these two harp notes at the end of Poltergeist that when we did Poltergeist in right. 2010, I think, yeah. could not find. Didn't really need them. It was just done something for the movie. But I'm like, I wonder where they got those from. Found them on the ET session. <coughs> <coughs> so, yeah, sometimes you do little pickups. Yeah. But, but uh, no, I was going to say, there was one cue in the film of E.T. that yeah. had to be done at the album sessions because right. it was replaced, so it probably was dubbed over from the digital to the... No, we probably recorded Mag for that. Okay, really. But just that? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, they wouldn't have run Mag on the rest. But I think what happened was, made my heart sank, is that when I got the session reports from the union, the film sessions said Universal Studios on it. Yeah. The album sessions said MCA Records. Yes. And MCA Records, now part of Universal Music Group, Universal Music Group is not at all in any way, shape, or form connected with Universal. Two Picture different publishing group. companies. Right, and two different companies. I mean, um, they divested their music group in 2004. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times when somebody can't find something, they point to the fire on the lot, which was 2008, right? And it's it's possible that they ended up there, but we looked high and low, but ended up finding an album. Right, the fact that the they UK. found what they found yeah, was right. extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, I found an album master in the UK to get those things for this Grammy Grammy winning album. Yeah, and, uh, and it went and it also gold went gold, right? It did go gold. Yeah. So um, my gold album was stolen. I had to get another one. <laughs> wow! Mm -hmm. Somebody broke into my studio in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Wow! One of the stories that comes up about ET ends up being something that happened on the first day. On the first day of recording was the uh, the bike chase yeah. and the goodbye scene. Mm -hmm. And we always hear both John and Stephen tell the story about how the picture was turned off and it was. Recorded. Wild. Yeah. What's your recollection of that? Well, I, I, I remember that because it wasn't 
and this is not uncommon, at least in the case of John and Jerry, where they get onto the dubbing stage, even though it, it was very difficult to do mock-ups in those days, like they do today. You can do full orchestral mock-ups on the sets today uh, in sampling, but they would be mainly piano. So when it would hit the stage, sometimes the director would go, oh my god, I didn't know that was happening. It's really, the music's great, but my picture is sideways. I gotta fix that. Uh, so most probably, best of my recollection, is that, Gene, that Stephen took a look and realized that the rhythm, that the way they had cut it, wasn't working with the music. And he said to John, I'm gonna turn off the picture you just record it, I will recut the picture to fit the music. And I, I even saw that happen to Jerry a couple of times. It has an effect on how the movie feels to us, though, right? Yeah. When the, when the music kind of leads the picture rather than vice versa. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, one thing I have to say for Stephen on his behalf is he really understands what music is all about when it comes to a movie. It's emotion. You know, it helps put you in a place. It's like the first cue made you saw. It, it, it made you feel a different way about the scene. And uh, d directors are very, very sensitive. Some are very open. Stephen is a good example. And he plays the music. You listen to the movies. You see his movies. The music is played. It's not hidden. Because some directors do not understand music. And they think it, it's a necessity the studio told them they have to have. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it becomes wallpaper for them. So they don't allow, and they don't want, a lot of the, the new directors don't understand music to the point that they don't want a composer to have freedom to emotionally help a scene grow. This is not the case of Jerry and John. Right, I mean, and especially looking at the mm -hmm. films from this era, it's like I'm pining away for scores that good and that prominent. Mm -hmm. No, we don't really have them, they're kind of as you say, wallpaper, and some, somehow trying to hide it, like they're afraid of it somehow. Yes, yes they feel that they need it. Well, they don't want so. melodies. Right. And and both John and Jerry are... Yet they all, the melody, yet yes. they'll be okay with wall-to-wall, -wall, you know, with two hours of music. Yeah. But two hours of music that you don't remember. Yeah. Whereas opposed to a score like E.T., which is 115 minutes, but there's only maybe 80 minutes of score. Poltergeist or is maybe 55. Patton. Right. 33 minutes of music, and you think there's music through the whole film. Right. So it's th that's how important it is. So uh, what about spotting? Because that's to me maybe part of the issue here is that <clears throat> this this you know music can't work unless it's absent. Yeah. Right? So, um, well, you want to let you want to. Jerry was always. It's very interesting. Mozart had a saying. Let me see if it's here on my thing. Uh, and then Jerry lived it. Um, it was. Well, basically, I don't know what I, what I did with it here. But Mozart said uh, what was most important was the space between the notes. And Jerry felt that way. And I know that John does. They believe in space, allowing things to breathe. Don't fill it up. Don't telegraph every moment. You know. um, and uh, it, 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 negative space in anything is so important. It's what's. It's not this. It's what's going on around it. It's so important. That's why if you listen to Jerry and John's scores, you really get into it. You hear that you can really get inside the orchestra. There's room to move around in there. And you hear voices, you know, melodic voices here, contrapuntal things happening that are there for a reason. You know, that, you know, help me tell you the story. Um, what do you think it is about, you know, I think the, the, the Stephen and John Williams collaboration is just unique in the history of cinema now. I mean, it's unbelievable. They're joined at the hip. You know, they always have emotionally. Uh, I mean, Jerry did. Poltergeist and the, two uh, gremlins. the Gremlins. Well, I mean, but where <coughs> Stephen was the director. Oh, right. You know, yeah. uh, Twilight's on the motion picture, the one episode. Oh, right. 
But, but, you, but it was, did he always come to the sessions of things that he was oh, executive producer on? Absolutely. Inner space. You know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Frank and Kathy too. A lot of the time, but it was mainly Stephen. Stephen loves to be on the scoring mm -hmm. stage. Mm -hmm. He really does. And he he sat there through get Gremlins and just had the best time. Mm -hmm. Just the best time. He loved it. Twilight Zone. He just sat there as a fan. Mm -hmm. Right. It was, uh, I guess, he was happy enough with E.T. that she went, to, went on to Temple of Doom and Color Purple. Yeah. Right. Color Purple, very, very <coughs> massive project with many, many different musical components. And, yeah. Uh, and Quincy Jones involved. And yeah, there were 22 composers on that film. <laughs> <laughs> really. Or 24, I'm not sure exactly what. Uh, the funny thing is that the most prominent out of all of those was Alexander Karaj, Sandy Karaj. Really? Yeah, he did, I think he did about almost a quarter of the film. Wow. Mm. Yeah, because Quincy, and I love Quincy, he uh, was going through a divorce at that time and he was just not there. I mean, he had come up with his themes, but he didn't really write the scores per se. I mean, he told people what he wanted them to do. I mean, to have 22 other composers writing cues, you were, you do this section. You know, you do and this is what's happening in here, and this is what I, this is the theme I want here. After that, John went into his Armin Steiner, Dan Wallen period, mm -hmm. and then in 1991 ended up with Sean Murphy, and yep. stuck with him since. Yeah. What do you think was, you know, in John's mind? There was, um, they spoke the same language, you know, there's communication. It's like what I had with Jerry. Yeah. Same thing. You just, it's intangible. You don't ask why. But it, Sean has a very unique way of recording and, and mixing, and uh, it, he's able to in, interpret what John is trying to say and get it up on the screen. Typically, really well. if you're going to record, let's say, a Jerry score, yeah. and you get onto the stage and you have to get microphones set up and everything set up, what, what do you know before that? Have you heard mock-ups? Have you looked at the score? I mean, Very infrequently do I hear a mock-up. Only if I ever heard a mock-up, it's generally because Jerry would ask me to come to the house and do some rough mixes of what he had recorded using Digital Performer and running his electronics. And I, he had a console and I had set it up for him with a couple of speakers. It was pretty primitive, but it worked. And I would do that for him so he could present them to the director. You know, like with Paul Verhoeven on uh, uh, oh, really? Basic Instinct and Total Recall. He did, did some cues, or the, I remember doing uh, uh, The Ghost in the Darkness. Mm -hmm. That was really cool score. Yeah, that's right. You know, taking, taking African chanting yeah. and figuring out how to rhythmically include it into a score and get that work. Do you have any favorites? What are your favorite Jerry's? They're all my favorite. All <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know that sometimes you hear what you've done and wish you could maybe fix it a little bit. Sometimes you're very happy with it. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> the, the thing is, the funny thing is, like I say, even about my door and stuff, I really don't want to go back and remix it. What for? I mean, I'm not the same person I was then. You know, not eating the same food, I'm, well, I was a lot younger, my desires and what I was looking for in life were different, you know, so it's... Because I remember it, when, we did, when we did Twilight Zone and you mm -hmm. wanted to remix the song yeah. that Jennifer Warren sang. Yeah. And you did a mix, you asked me what I thought, and I said, well, it's different. Yeah, it was different. We and ended up getting... The new one, the original. Right, and you said, you know what, that's where we were at the time, let's stick with yeah, it. Yeah, let's just stick with it. Uh, the one thing that we did remix on that was the... Uh, the overlay of Scatman. Scatman. We, because oh, no, and also Rob. We moved Rob's voice. Right. Bit, yeah. We moved it. I, then I couldn't do it because of time and whatnot. We didn't have the tools then. But Scatman Crothers, we overdubbed the orchestra of Scatman, and it was never dead on. And it really never felt comfortable to me. So Mike acquiesced them. I, uh, well, I think we moved Rod also. Uh, we, we did Rod. Music came over him, and he said, no, "We got to move that up." Yeah, there, we yeah, move so. things around to get it really right. We fixed it. Those those are things that are okay, you know, to do. There's certain things, but like on ET and on Poltergeist, those mixes are locked. Don't want to screw with them. Yeah. 
So a lot of people, you know, ask when E T was coming out, was it remixed? There's really nothing to remix. No. You have three channels to work with and you and it's a well there's four. Four, four but surround. You know, I don't know if did you use surround? We use I use the surround. Yeah. 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 Um, but it's a matter of of replicating what was there and keeping the original intent and not trying to put today's sensibilities on top of it. The idea is is, you know, most people listen to MP3s these days, and it's streaming, and it sounds like crap. And uh, our goal here was to make it as good as we could do and represent the original analog if possible. I have to ask you about that because a few things have happened. First of all, we have had this MP3 uh, you know, mm -hmm. that everybody listens to. But we've also seen vinyl come back. Yep. And you are also a big proponent of the high resolution, again, <coughs> high resolution to the average listener. Yeah. And that's very, very challenging. Yeah, well, um, one, one, one interesting thing that's happening now, there's a process called MQA, which is Master Quality Audio, um, that's come on the scene. And it's very interesting because you can take a 192.24 uh, file and it, they do what they call origami, where they're literally five pieces where they're folding D into, into C and C into D and then it all goes in to A into the noise floor. So it makes it a really small file. It's not data compression. I don't know how they do it. And then if you have a property, and that means you can stream it like Tidal is doing. If you have a decoder, it opens it up to the full glory in your house. So I have been pushing to do that on a CD because we're losing the physical market. I can't put it on vinyl, but you can put it on the CD, which means that it wouldn't be 192.24, uh, it would be 176.4 because everything has to be in levels of 44.1, which is the CD, CD yeah. 16. So I have, and I did it with ET, uh, where I encoded it, put it on a CD, and you can burn a CD and play in any CD player. If you've got the decoder and you plug it in the digital output, it opens up to the full enchilada. Very exciting, because for the people that buy soundtracks, the future is golden. Although I must say, a lot of soundtracks were only ever done at 44.1. Yeah, <laughs> and that would be a problem had we found the digital master on the ETL. Yeah, we would have been locked. We're limited to that, right? But so. in this case, we had the 35 millimeter mags plus a quarter inch from England of the yeah. album master, and we convinced the the sound people at Universal to do the transfer at 192.24. Right. I'm sorry we didn't do it at 384, <laughs> 32 bit. Yeah. That's the next one because we can put that onto the CD as well. Wow. Now, and that's getting about as close to the original analog master as possible. So it's kind of exciting. Uh, the major record companies are on board. They're trying to figure out how this is going to get paid for, what they're going to charge people. Uh, I'm very involved <coughs> in trying to convince the people that developed MQA to at least give us a minimum of a year to try it out. Do these discs put them out there and see how the market is. Because if it works, we'll have physical media for a while now. Mm -hmm. They'll extend the life maybe five to 10 years, mm -hmm. which is a big deal. Because yeah. composers and artists are not making any money anymore. Because there's no physical. It's all either all in concerts or concerts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know. recently got also involved with the Disney Legacy Collection. You did yeah. a number of scores for Disney. Yeah. Right? You want to tell us what I some did, of those were? Well, I did. Uh, started working with Alan Menken on Beauty and the Beast. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't record that. Uh, John Richards did the uh, score. And, um, oh God, it just went blank. Oh, for the songs? Huh? For the songs? You mean to do the songs? Songs, yeah. Howard Ashman. Who? Howard Ashman. No, 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 he wrote it. He wrote it. I'll take this one. Anyway, uh, he's just, uh, uh, he has a scoring mixer, but he was living in New York and they recorded the songs in New York. I mixed it, remixed the whole thing for the album. Then I wound up doing it in 32 languages <laughs> for all the foreigners. Then I started doing a lot with that one. And we did Beauty and the Beast musical, and I wound up producing that 
for the New York cast recording, and then in London, and Germany, and uh, Japan, and then Australia, going around the world and doing it. So I've got Beauty and the Beast. So, which, <laughs> so we, one of the things we're doing now, I just did Neil Balk right here help me, uh, is they, Disney has a legacy collection. And so far I've done uh, Little Mermaid, and uh, now Beauty, and Pocahontas. We got Aladdin to do next. <laughs> um, and go in and take the entire score, remix it. In most cases, I just went with my mixes or the original mixes of the songs. Don't go near them because they are locked. You know, it's a period of time, history. But you all haven't heard the whole score beyond it in a right. new movie, so it's open season. You know, you can go with it. So Neil Help, and w which Mike does, is go in and take the all the cues and throw it up against the movie and make sure that it all sticks. We've got the right piece of music at the right place, the right edits, overlays. inserts, and overlays, all that in there. So these uh, legacy discs, Disney is really going to town to do it right. And it's really, really I might hat off to them. Uh, I did a, uh, one of these events with them. They have a thing uh, called Friends of, of Rodin. And remember the thinker? That's the Rodin. And it's it basically, it's a, uh, where they have lunch. People bring their food. It's a big room, conference room. They have a big sound system in there and whatnot. And they get people from different trades in, in making of mu music and movies and whatnot to come in and talk. And I did one on beauty, what we were doing. Talking about it. Uh, and they're just, the next one up I know is Aladdin. And I can't wait to get into that one because that one, unlike, it's a funny thing because um, beauty was all done digitally on Mitsubishi 32 tracks. Uh, and it did it all at 48K, so there was really nothing in high, considered high resolution. 48K sits in This is a Pro Digi. Is no. No, that's different. No, the Mitsubishi? Yeah. <coughs> I don't know what they called it. Okay. I mean, the first Mitsubishi 32 track <coughs> happened, we used as a backup on Twilight so. The motion picture. Right, and we have we found that. Right? We found you, that. You wanted to ultimately use the mag. Yeah. Uh, and we did mags as well. Because the focus was on the mag, the 32 track, and we did analog, 24 track locked up, but I don't know whether where that yeah. went. That was the thing at, at Warner's. They were insistent. And I was cool about it. And I even ran a two track stereo digital recorder, like I did on, on these things. So we were running, what, mag, four track mags, 32 track, uh, analog 24 track, and a stereo. And the other backups are a half inch or? Yeah, probably a half inch. So we were a running, the, so the machine room was rocking. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and, but the interesting thing is on, on these, and I, I think maybe the pictures went around, you can see the pictures of the machine room. I think the color already somebody sold them on there. <laughs> uh, you can see the mag machines, and there's there's two machines there that are playing what Ken Hall had built. One was a dialogue track, and very rough, and another was a click track. Uh, and those days we didn't have uh, digital clicks like we do now, where it could be programmed. And Jerry used to do a lot of his own programming. Um, and right. you know, yeah, we got the mm -hmm. photos again. If you want to see. Yeah, there it is. So the, all the, the clicks were done optically. It would be optical punches, like because that's what like the streamers that used to go across the screen were scraped into the film and then punched. You know, where physically the done. Right now, you just punch. all everything now is just on the keyboard. Yeah, it's on the keyboard. You don't have to worry about it. And he, this one probably or that one, I don't know. They're rewinding here. But all the, the pops were built by hand and then transferred to mag. <laughs> and all, and you know, God 
bless Kenny, I mean, if, if something changed, they couldn't do it. They had to work around it, do it in free time, and then cut it in. Wow. But also, I mean, to just do another take of a cue, I mean, you're talking about an actual physical reel and a projection Well, yeah, the projector was upstairs, projection room, same thing at Fox. You're going to wait for it to be ready. Then you have to wait for it to back up, and the projector, projectionist controlled everything. Well, you had machine control? Yeah, he, oh, wow. he fired these machines. Wow. Out. But everybody had to, okay, let's stop, let's take it back from the top. Everybody had to rewind everything. And it was kind of cool, actually, because the rhythm of the session was a lot more relaxed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah, not a digital, it's like... It was kind of like bowling, which I don't like how they automate the scoring now. Oh. I used to like to take the break to sit down and write your score. Yeah. Now. yeah. But now it's like you're ready to go because the, the machine doesn't... Yeah. Well, my, my mother used to copy music a lot for a lot of movies, John's stuff. I mean, she did copy E.T. And uh, for the orchestra. And, you know, the, the, the copies were there on the session, sitting there, right. there for me to know the part. They didn't have to write it out. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Everything's changed. But it's cool, though. I think you were about to say what, why you're excited about Latin. Oh, because it's all analog. <laughs> it was all analog, 24-track. Uh, uh, After being the Wow. It'll be interesting yeah. to when if, uh, when you get hold of like if, if it has raw takes or more raw volume stuff. Uh, well, that old. that's the thing I was talking uh, with Disney yesterday about. There is a tape that we did when we were doing uh, a couple of his songs where Robin did about twenty minutes, <laughs> just freedom, and it's. Fabulous. It's wow. not not X-rated, but it's <laughs> just stream of consciousness grooving. It's coming out. I thought I had a copy of it. I wish it did. But I, I, they're going to look for it at the studio. Cool. Yeah. Um, we're going to wrap up with a clip of, from ET before we do that. Uh, oh, we were here for ET. Can we have uh, any questions? First? Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, just to set this up, I spent the first part of this year three and a half months in the hospital. Since I've gone out and done things afterwards, this is the best thing I've done. Yeah. And, I, and I want to thank both of you. And Mike knows this. And I say this to Mike constantly. The work you guys do, you bring a lot of joy to people who buy what you do. You brought joy to people. You, my childhood was changed by you and what you did. I'm also a huge Doors fan. I have no Doors questions. I'm not asking you to sign. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But, I can assure you that. But what you do, particularly what you're talking about with the future of physical media, is just great news. And uh, the other thing I wanted to say is the, the passion that you put into stuff is really rippling out amongst these younger film score fans who are discovering these composers. Because really today, um, we don't have the same experience, and you both know why. But my last question, my real question is, just off the top of your head, if you don't know, you can just say no. Is there a composer today, a uh, modern day composer, working that you really like? And if you have one, can you just say why? You, like? you know, it, it, I like a lot of, of the stuff that uh, uh, James and Howard is doing. He's allowed now because he's enough success that he can start, I mean, that he can do James. Right. He is limited. And you've done some for him. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I love it. And, uh, but I also like, uh, I, I just watched Logan. I have, remember the Bullish Picture Academy, I get all these screeners oh, yeah. you know, by the pound. And I just watched Logan in my studio in Surround. And uh, I thought that Michael did a great job on that Bullish one. Yeah. And um, I like what Aaron Zygman does. Aaron's uh, really good. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of, it, it depends on the movie, it depends on whether the composer is allowed to be. Wow. Next. Wait, you didn't answer. Oh. <laughs> oh, me? <laughs> yeah, you. I said both of you. Oh, okay. I, I have to agree about, about Marco, actually. You know, he surprises me. And, um, and I haven't seen that, so um, but I'm looking forward to it. Real quick, I have to give a shout out to Neil Bulk. Yep. And Dave, um, also, who do projects that I love and appreciate. And you guys were in my thoughts when I was in hospital, too. Well, you guys, you know, 
being able to dig down and find out what's under the rocks, we all forgot about. I mean, you, you, you do enough in your life that you don't remember. And, and actually coming back to these movies later on, it's like re-experiencing them again, but in a different way. You know, they does bring emotionally some things. I mean, like the, the very end of this film, that's all the E.T. when you know E.T.'s going bye bye, the dog's barking and E.T.'s talking. You know, um, I mean, I, I had lost my father right at that point, mm -hmm. and when I did the, the the first home video version for Universal Home Video, I mean, I, I broke down. You know, it really, really has Six years have gone by, and then you're now there faced with it again, probably not expecting it. That's yeah, happening so it just, it's amazing what, you know, and it, it, Ken Hall tells a story, unfortunately, passed away last year. Tell you what, why don't you roll the scene without the music, then you tell us. Okay, well, I can do it while it's happening. Okay, yeah. Wait, at the end this of is, this, this is, is it, the sequence? It's the ending, yeah. Okay. Just the Elliot goodbye. So you'll end the um, scene. It's, it's amazing to see you without these. And I also point out that the original plan was that there was a scene that followed this one. It, you may have seen it if you have the old LaserDisc bonus features of uh, a sort of a coda to the film in which they're back in Elliot's room. Any D&D fans here? Any D&D players? Okay, yeah, so playing Dungeons and Dragons and now Elliot's the Dungeon Master. But this is, of course, written in film before you know what the score is going to be. All right. When you hear the score that ended up being at the end of this film, recorded wild on top of it, and the picture cut to it. You can't possibly go anywhere after yeah. that. It ends like an opera. Right? And it's, it's like the end of the ring song. And, in, and I think in the dub, it and really, it really slammed it home. Right, Stephen. He knew what he said. Right. Stop. We're done. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Lights. Yeah. Lights, please. Of course. Cool. Uh, Explorers. I know there was a lot of reverb on that one. Were you involved in Explorers? Uh, there was. A, I, all I can say is, just depends on the score and the film. Did Jerry seem to get more interested in reverb, the washier sound? No, we were life? we were more into uh, air. You know that it sounded open, mm -hmm. and that you could hear all the voices and all the inter. Because the insurrection is like not doesn't sound at all like Star Trek motion picture. Yeah, I know those. It was different. Like um, uh, my favorite first contact is one of my absolute favorites of his. Mm. No scores. You were you had your hand up earlier. Yeah. Oh, I was just curious. Who decides and how do they decide what tracks from the score are on the album? Oh, that generally it's the composer. And what would Jerry say if he were here to uh, he would with say, us all these expansions? He'd say, he'd say uh, well, you know, I don't agree with it, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true, because he only wanted what he thought was best as a composition. I mean, I can go, I remember we were doing Total Recall, and you know the whole sequence where Arnold goes through the big x-ray where they have it, and then he breaks through and it's a big fight and he winds up on a, a subway. Um, we finished, we cut that, we, we recorded that cue, and Jerry listened to the playback and he said, ah, I've written a movement. <laughs> For, you know, he never, I couldn't get him to write a symphony. Good. Yes. Um, I don't know if you guys can sound better, and I can concur with you about the, top, the Robin Williams thing, because I actually got access to those tracks, and I used them on a, Film, my favorite Martian, we were doing an attempt. We were trying to, to uh, put a voice. You have that tape? Not anymore. I, mm -hmm. I might be able to find a backup for it because it was a number of years before. I used, now I say everything. Back then, we just. Yeah, I did too. I too. Did. But that was one that I've. I might be able to get because I do work with Disney Animation. And yeah, I'm well, I've, I've got a, a Tommy Millstone, who's mm -hmm. the guy over there. He's. He digs down, he finds things. Yeah. So we'll, we'll I might be able to find it for you. Okay. Another question I have, I have a 16 year old boy who uh, wants to get into composition for film and media mm -hmm. stuff. And uh, what would be the best, you know, for the education right now? He plays like guitar, bass, and drums, and he's like. He's God, that's so hard. I, I, All I can tell you is he ought to listen to as much music as possible. I mean, Jerry Goldsmith's biggest influence was Brahms. <clears throat> And then, you know, he got into some 12-tone and uh, Stravinsky. 
Um, but didn't you want Stravinsky's arrangement of the national anthem? We did use it. It's on. The, no, that's not what it is. No. That Stravinsky's version is the what's on the front of this. No, no it's not. It, it is. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so right. they ended up with the sort of the, the Air Force arrangement. Oh, so. okay. But I know we recorded Stravinsky's version. Really? Could have sworn he he really wanted that. Yeah, Jerry wanted that one. Check that out. It's on you. It's really, really tripped his Stravinsky. Yes, Marshall. So. Yeah, um, you mentioned that last few of E.T. was recorded while they turned off the picture. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no? no, no, no. That was not the picture? That was my picture. It was really just... cut that slowly. Oh, yeah. And without the music, it's like you never... Yeah. Oh, well, no, I think he's asking, no, the, yeah, that cue was yeah. actually done. That was one of the ones that said, I'll turn off the picture. Yeah. Oh, okay. He to the music. Yeah, and yeah. Then he, he, he did recut it to it. Uh, On our new release, there's an alternate version of it, and you can hear the tempos are kind of like they slow down. Because Generally he's trying to slow down and made it. Yeah, he's trying to keep the So he added frames. Right, in the early days, he's yeah. trying to keep up with what the pic how the picture's cut, which uh -huh. requires the tempo to change. And it's kind of uncomfortable. You sort of feel like you're just not. So turning the picture off, he can just naturally feel how the music wants to be. Well, you, you, you know, as a as a as a film editor, Marshall's great film editor, uh, and done a bunch of films with Joe Dante. And you know as well as I did, they get in there and all. As I said, oh my God, that's what's going on. I like what the what the music is saying better. I'll go back, and I'm sure you had to go back and recut. I don't, I don't remember ever doing that. Actually. Really? No. Maybe. Maybe. We did it once. I mean, not a lot. It's it doesn't happen that often. Not but, that often. But it does happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that's yeah. why without the music it seems so slow, because they yeah. obviously went back and yeah. added to the shots. Well, it's so also like in Poltergeist in that opening sequence. It feels so slow. Yeah. yeah. Until the music got it. Yeah, sure does. Yeah. I mean, it just changes the, your perception of everything. You know, and also it creates a memory. You know, that's why when you listen to this music, I'm sure you you well, feel like you could still When I was a little music. kid and uh, I went to see, you're not going to believe this, but they used to perform The Sorcerer's Apprentice from Fantasia with a live orchestra a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, a little kid, I remember my mother taking me. And then when I saw Fantasia, the Rite of Spring blew me away, and I remembered dinosaurs. You know, mm -hmm. so it's you know you remember a certain piece of music and it's evocative and brings scenes scenes to your head. Mm -hmm. it's it's a bit, yeah, um, I don't think I remember this since we visited Jerry before Star Trek the Motion Picture, or we're doing it. I wonder if you remember this too. Um, this goes back to the question about what music was selected. We spoke to him about isolated music for the for the release of director's edition, and I just remembered that um, he also at that point he talked about releases of music, and he said, uh, "Whatever happened to even wanting for more? Even want to even have about people even wanting more?" And he was understanding that people were getting complete scores, but I remember that that was. Do you remember him saying that too? Yeah, no, I know. I don't remember him talking about. He's referring to certain scores he did with bottle caps. He said it was for the bottle cap collectors. Like we don't really need Mr. Baseball, you know. <laughs> but yeah, well, so. there were a lot of scores that he didn't want to come out. So I mean, or he would complain that they didn't play well enough, and that's yeah. why you know. I've we had a couple of movies where the orchestra just was not in sync, mm. and he didn't want not did not want soundtracks off. Yeah. Plus, there was of course limitations at the time. If you're doing a single LP, you had maybe at most 50 minutes to work with, right? At so, most. So if you had uh, a hundred minute score, you can't. Do it. So yeah, the, 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 I mean, Star Trek, the motion picture, we only came out with one disc. 37 minutes. Mm -hmm. right, so. Mm -hmm. so, and then some interesting decisions are made. Like the original album for Poltergeist, the first thing is the end credits. That's right. The next track is from the climax of the movie. So it's like, it has nothing, but those of us who like respond narratively to the score yeah, well, want to hear it. Jerry was more into compositionally, how he felt right, like it, right. it played as a piece. Right. That's where he was coming from. It's an interesting, but they're both valid. I mean, yeah. the listening experience or hearing the score, and it's yeah. they're both very valid. So, anybody else? So, okay, yeah. well, this was really a great time. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah.
anniversaries one more time with all you guys and to be with uh, Bruce, who I love uh, working with, and I hope we do a lot more projects together. So thanks all for coming. Even stuff that I didn't do. Let's go for it. Yeah, let's do it. No, no, no. And I mean, it's like, I don't have any. So people say, when are you going to retire? I say, why? <laughs> Amen. Well, you can't. John Williams just asked that. He doesn't know it's like retired from breathing. Yeah, that's <laughs> about it. You know, it's, it, uh, uh, Victor Borger comes on stage, uh, one thing, and he's, he stands there and he goes, a bunch of smoke comes out. <laughs> yeah, he's holding the cigarette. And he says, I've been, I'm real tired today. I've been breathing. <laughs> 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 <laughs>